Greetings to all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the third of our lecture series. And um, we are particularly delighted to have Professor Christina Voigt from the University of Oslo Law School, not only because she really is one of the great experts in climate change, um, but also she's a very dear colleague and good friend that I've had the pleasure and honor of knowing for some years now. Uh, we worked together at uh, the IUCN, World Commission Environmental Law, uh, where Christina is the chair <clears throat> of the climate change a specialist group and task force. Um, but um, I also know Christina from the fantastic work she did representing Norway uh, at the climate change negotiations for some 10 years and where she really is one of the leaders and particularly on the issue that she'll be talking to us today about compliance and transparency. And I can't think of someone who can lecture better on this than Christina Voigt. Um, she has published numerous books, articles. Uh, she's a sought after speaker. She does many, many things for the environment. And as we say, she's passionate about the environment and I can attest to that, I know that. Uh, so, dear Christine, it's wonderful that you will be lecturing today. And um, so I will pass the floor to um, our uh, also dear friend, colleague, and co-sponsor uh, with CIL, and of course the World Commission Environmental Law, <clears throat> Petra Minarep, Professor Petra Minarep from Durham University, and she will be moderating uh, this session. So, dear Petra, I turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much, dear Nidufa, and a very warm welcome to Christina. It's a great honor and pleasure to have you here and indeed to be organizing this lecture series with you and with Nidufa and with the great support team that we've got now at CIL and at Durham University as well. It's a, a, we are very fortunate uh, to be able to do this in this new online environment, I suppose, as well. And I'm really looking forward to talking about the law on climate change again today. It's so important that we think about these uh, legal impact and the legal developments that come from the international level and then filter down to the national level. And I'm looking forward to learning um, about your insights and your research today, Christina, and a very warm welcome as well to the audience. Uh, looking forward to this session and to the questions. Uh, we had very lively sessions the last two lectures, so I'm hoping this will be again a very uh, intense debate after the lecture. And without any further ado, I hand over to Christina. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Nilofer, for your kind words of introduction and to Petra, likewise. It's a real pleasure to be here today and to talk about something that is very dear to my heart, something that I've worked on for a long time and what I hope uh, we can engage together with the audience on a journey really through the entire Paris Agreement. Um, Ninofer, as you mentioned, this is the third lecture in our lecture series. We had uh, a wonderful lecture by Professor Dan Bodansky on, on the, the, the climate uh, negotiations on the COPs. And last time we had David Freestone, who talked about uh, finance, financial institutions, financial support and mechanisms. And today we will look at the issue of parties accountability under the Paris Agreement. So I try to um, share my slides so that we hopefully can get some virtual backup here as well. Can you see that? Can you just confirm that's there? Yeah, thank you. Um, so we'll look at uh, the question of accountability of parties under the Paris Agreement and we will venture in the issue of compliance as well. I just want to mention at this point that, that I'm currently the co-chair of the, the Paris Agreement on Implementation and uh, um, uh, uh, Compliance Committee. Uh, and I will say a little bit uh, about the work, the current work of the committee towards the end of this talk. Now, when one talks about the Paris Agreement, the first uh, thing that usually is mentioned is that it is a bottom-up agreement. It's a legally binding agreement 
but basically parties are free to do whatever they want. Uh, it's, it's bottom up and we have this con, uh, concept of uh, a tool of nationally determined contributions and, and there is not much accountability to parties. Now, the uh, intention of my talk today is really to say and to show that this is not entirely the case. There are several elements of accountability built into the structure of the Paris Agreement. They differ in strength, they differ in their um, application, but they are there. And I'd like to invite you on this journey today uh, to the Paris Agreement and to look at different uh, aspects and degrees of accountability. Now, uh, to start off, um, what I would like to do is I first want to say a couple of words about what is accountability? How do we understand that term? And then I'll look at three different aspects that lead to accountability. The first one are the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions, and the information which parties are required to submit when they are communicating their NDC. The second aspect is the, uh, um, the whole framework of transparency, the enhanced transparency uh, framework. And then the third one is, of course, the committee to facilitate implementation and promote, promote compliance with the provisions of the Paris Agreement. And then in the end, uh, offer some uh, reflections. Now, this talk is based, uh, and I apologize for this kind of self-promotion here, but I just wanted to point to this uh, paper. It is based, uh, based on a paper which I had the privilege to write together and publish uh, last year, write together with um, Gao Chiang from China. Now, um, the, the, the reason why Gao and, and myself decided to write this paper was that we both had uh, facilitator uh, roles in the negotiations of the rulebook of the Pairs Agreement. Gao was co-facilitator of the negotiations on the Enhanced Transparency Framework, and I had the privilege to be the co-facilitator for the rules and modalities for the Compliance Committee. So we've seen the, the rules develop and then finally being agreed in Katowice, and we thought it might be helpful if at least the two of us started to put our heads together and look at how the issue of transparency and compliance and implementation, of course, link together, how it all fits together um, in order to understand the, the issue of accountabilities of parties under the Paris Agreement. So we published this in the Nordic Environmental Law Journal um, just, just last year. And what we discovered in this paper is really, um, it, it, it revealed to us the, the, the general structure, the, the, the framework of the Paris Agreement and how it all, uh, in the end, makes sense together. So back to accountability. What is accountability? It is, of course, a multifaceted term. You can put a lot of different meanings into it. Uh, in general, it means answerability for actions or, or omissions. And under international law, you sometimes have the application of a very narrow understanding to accountability, like the uh, right to limit power. Now, in, in our understanding and what we did in this paper, we ex, uh, in, um, in, ad adopted a broader understanding where we looked at accountability as the responsibility for actions according to the standards that parties agreed to under an international treaty uh, and the responsibility to disclose them and to be transparent about what they are doing. So in the context of Paris Agreement, the definition of accountability that we adopted in, in that paper was the answerability of parties for aspects of their performance in accordance with the provisions of the agreement and in relation to the mechanisms and procedures that were established under the agreement. And what we discovered is that under the Paris Agreement, there are actually increasing accountabilities accountability degrees, and I'll come back to that throughout my, my uh, lecture. They, they increase from fairly weak accountability to stronger or medium, and then strongest uh, um, degrees of accountability. And there is, in a way, an accountability continuum between different aspects of the uh, agreement. Accountability is defined, or we define it by three elements, 
One is the rules and the guidance that are um, contained both in the pairs agreement and in the decisions of the CMA ever since, in particular the, the rule book from Katowice, but also in the structures and mechanisms established under the agreement, for example, the transparency framework, including the technical expert review, and then finally the measures that can be applied in context or in relation to the rules, both by the trans and, uh, under the transparency framework and of course, the compliance uh, element, compliance committee. Transparency is important because it provides clarity on what uh, each party's contribution is. And that cl clarity is very important because we need to know where we are headed towards the collective temperature goals of the agreement and also uh, for tracking progress of uh, each party's achievement of its NDC. But transparency is also important, very important in order to build mutual trust and to build confidence and to promote the effective implementation of the agreement. This is what we're seeing in Article 13 in the transparency um, regime. Transparency is also important because it feeds into the global stock take. This is what part of what the global stock take takes stock of in light of the goals of the agreement. But transparency is also in, important in order to provide an opportunity for sharing of experiences and for mutual learning, for best, best practices, but also for challenges and how to address those challenges. It creates peer pressure between parties in order to facilitate the improvement of their performance, which is an accountability element, but also to enable the public to engage in domestic decision making and to put pressure and, and the, the needed uh, policies forwards in order to implement the peers agreement and to implement the NDCs. And compliance, the other part of the accountability um, um, uh, uh, element here is crucial, absolutely crucial for the effective functioning of the Paris Agreement. Um, compliance, I'll come back to it, captures the core legal obligations that parties have under the Paris Agreement, which are in a way the, the very backbone, the spine of the agreement without which it would not work. And that was recognized by the uh, parties of the Framework Convention when they adopted the Pairs Agreement in, in 2015 and when they included in Article 15 a, a mechanism to facilitate implementation and to promote compliance. Its nature is facilitative. This is the result of a trade-off between the inclusion of a compliance mechanism on the one hand, and the need to uh, have stringency in, in all the other uh, provisions, but also in terms of, of participation. There's always a trade-off between the different elements that you are able to agree on. But the compliance aspect is also meant to enhance trust and confidence that parties actually do what they signed up for, and if not, that there is some level of accountability. It is designed to hold parties accountable for their performance in light of course, of the nature of the relevant provisions of the agreement and in relation to the established mechanisms and procedures under the agreement. Now, I already mentioned to you that, that we in our papers call this a accountability continuum because it is something that flows through the entire agreement and to what parties are required to do. And it starts with the... Um, communication of course of NDC and the need uh, and the legal requirement to provide, to provide information necessary for the clarity, um, uh, transparency and understanding ICTU of what parties actually put in their NDC. But there is also more in terms of uh, uh, being transparent about upfront. It also applies to the information on finance, uh, technology transfer and capacity building. Now, from that initial um, requirement to put out NDCs flows the, the next element of accountability under the Enhanced Transparency Framework, where parties are required, legally required, to provide biennial transparency, biennial trans trans transparency reports, BTRs, uh, where they provide information, amongst other things, on the uh, progress in implementing and achieving their NDC. Um, parties also, developed country parties in this case, are required to provide biennial communications on projected levels of finance under Article 9.5. This is a communication that does not go through the transparency framework, but also, of course, is meant to enhance uh, transparency. And finally, this all 
flows in a way towards the uh, compliance and implementation uh, committee under article 15 because it can pick up or will pick up situations where parties for example have not submitted an NDC or have not uh, uh, reported under the transparency framework um, or have not uh, submitted their biannual financial communications under Article 9.5. So there is a certain consequence and definitely a certain logic on how these different elements fit together. And we call this increasing degrees of accountability and I'll use this traffic light system. It's very simple, simplified. I apologize for that, but it hopefully enhances a little bit the visuality of, of how these uh, elements fit together. Now, let's focus a little bit on that first aspect of accountability on NDC communication and information. As we all know, parties have the, the core legal obligation of parties is to prepare, communicate and maintain an NDC, successive NDCs. Um, that is the legal obligation. The content itself of the NDC is not legally binding because, as I, uh, I highlighted here in red, Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the agreement says that the, a party puts forward an NDC that it intends to achieve, uh, which is an intentional uh, declaration, but it is not legally binding. The legal binding obligations is just putting forward the NDC. And Article 4.3, Con includes some further guidance uh, on what the NDC should look like or how the NDC should look like, where it uh, talks about that each party's successive NDC will represent a progression beyond the current NDC and each NDC will reflect uh, each party's highest possible ambition, reflecting its common but differentiated responsibilities and re respective capabilities in the light of different national circumstances. So this is a starting point. Parties have that obligation to communicate an NDC and uh, it, there is the, the, the expectation that it will represent a progression and reflect its highest possible ambition. Now, when communicating an NDC, parties have the obligation, it says in Article 4, Paragraph 8, that all parties shall provide, they have the obligation to provide the information necessary for clarity, transparency, and understanding of the ICTU. Um, the provision in Article 4.8 is rather slim. It didn't really go into much detail on what kind of information that is. And that was then um, picked up by the Paris Agreement Rulebook in Decision 4, CMA 1 from 2018 which sets up a guidance on uh, that, uh, on the requirements of information necessary to, for clarity, transparency, and understanding. Now, parties have put and are putting forward the NDC and they are um, um, publicly uh, available at the currently still interim registry at the UNFCCC website, but there is fairly weak accountability connected to that kind of information that parties provide in their NDC. Although it's a legally binding obligation, as I said, where parties shall provide this information, um, it is something that is not really being picked up by any mechanisms under the Paris Agreement. The uh, decision from Katowice also says that parties shall apply this information as applicable to their NDC, so it's inherently linked to the type and nature of each party's NDC. But there is, other than that parties put out this information, there is no mechanism, no procedure, no tool under the PEARS agreement to review that uh, or to adopt any measures if parties do not provide this information. So what we have and that why we call it weak uh, accountability is that there's still a certain degree of accountability because the information is publicly available. It can be picked up by peers or by stakeholders or by legal researchers and can be criticized or praised. But under the agreement, there is no particular measure or mechanism to, uh, to review that kind of uh, information. Um, the second aspect of accountability, which moves to the, the orange light in our um, traffic light system, is the transparency framework established under Article 13, which under which each party shall provide certain information. 
um, the tool, the, uh, the how can we take the, 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 the information being put forward is now uh, defined by the compact term biennial transparency report, a BTR, which parties are required to put forward every other year, but only from 2024 onwards. So we haven't seen any BTR yet. The term BTR does not appear in the Paris Agreement. It's something that came about in the negotiations of the uh, of the rule book adopted in Katowice. So you well, won't find it in the Paris Agreement, but you'll find the obligation to provide this information in Article 13, um, paragraph 7, 8, 9, um, and 10, I think. Um, the decision in the rule book from Katowice, decision 18, CMA 1, uh, set forward the modalities, procedures, and guidelines for the um, transparency reports, biennial transparency reports, and uh, contains actually very, uh, it's probably the longest decision in that rule book, contains a, a, an incredible lot of, of detail. Here it has to suffice to say that the biennial transparency report has a number of mandatory elements, and then there are a couple of voluntary and elements. When it comes to mandatory elements, every party has to include a national greenhouse gas inventory report that is already written in Article 13, paragraph 7, literal A of the agreement. Um, every party also has to provide information to track progress in achieving and implementing its NDC under Article 4. And uh, developed countries, par country parties have to provide uh, have to provide information on the support provided. And support here again is a cumulative term, including financial support, technology transfer, and capacity building um, support. So these are the must elements in the biennial transparency report for e either all parties or <clears throat> when it comes to support only developed country parties. Um, in addition to that, transparent and transparency reports uh, can also include further aspects, for example, impacts um, uh, or adaptation uh, measures, also info information and support provided by developing countries. They may also want to be transparent and open to, to the world and actually how much they are contributing financially uh, and in terms of technology uh, uh, transfer and capacity building to the implementation of the agreement and also support needed and received by developing countries. Now, these reports, as I said, have to be submitted every other year from 2024 onwards. And each report, each biennial transparency report will go through a technical expert review. The technical expert review teams will look at the consistency of the information that parties provide in their report with the modalities, procedures, and guidelines for reporting. That's very important because the technical expert review teams will not look, for example, at the adequacy of an NDC or the adequacy of actions or support. They will look at whether the information provided is consistent with the requirements for providing information. In addition, technical expert review teams will also consider a party's implementation and achievement of its NDC. They will consider support provided and identify in this context areas of improvement. Now, as I said, we haven't seen any uh, biennial transparency report yet, neither, of course, any technical expert review report. But this is something that we will hopefully see kicking in in 2024 with the first technical expert review reports expected maybe in 2025. Now the technical expert review teams will issue then a report on each biennial transparency report of each party. So it's quite a huge undertaking here. And these uh, reports by the TR uh, teams, the technical expert review teams will contain recommendations for certain mandatory requirements for reporting, shell requirements that we have in decision 18 CMA1, or uh, encouragements to parties for those elements for reporting that are not mandatory. And in addition then, each party uh, will also have to participate in what is called a facilitative multilateral 
consideration of progress. So it's a long line of, of uh, different elements of the transparency framework. And I try to simply uh, visualize it in this way, which starts with the BTRs, with the Biennial Transparency Reports. And of course, you only have a BTR if you had an NDC in the first place. And then the BTRs go to the technical expert review, which then the, the technical expert review teams issue a technical expert report. And then at the end of the transparency, um, uh, process is the participation in the FMCP, the facilitator, facilitative multilateral consideration of progress. And, and then starts all again two years uh, later. So what does it tell us about accountability in the context of transparency? So here, uh, Gao and I, we uh, found that under the transparency, accountability is there. It's not very, very strong. It's medium strong. So that's why they, the traffic light is, is orange. But we have guidance, there are modalities, procedure and guidelines as adopted, <laughs> I'm sorry, under decision 18 CMA1. There is a review for what parties do and how well they are um, applying and uh, uh, complying with those uh, uh, reporting guidelines. As I said, there's a technical expert review. And the technical expert review teams can actually apply certain measures in terms of coming forward with recommendations for the mandatory requirements or encouragement for the voluntary uh, reporting requirements. So there is a certain degree of accountability. It is stronger than what we have with uh, regard to the communication of NDCs um, because it has these elements, but it is not very strong um, yet, but it is something that we do uh, consider as an accountability element. And then uh, the third aspect, of course, <clears throat> is the uh, uh, implementation and compliance committee. And you remember the, the traffic light arrow in the beginning, green, orange, and then red uh, to, to the compliance committee. It sounds a little bit uh, harsh, and I'll, I'll try to explain that it's maybe not just as red as it seems to be, uh, but there is a certain logic to it. Well, first of all, the in implementation and compliance committee uh, is, was already established in the Paris Agreement itself in Article 15, which established a facilitation and compliance mechanism, which shall consist of a committee. So that, that is uh, the, the committee that I'm referring to. Um, the committee uh, or the, the work of the committee is supposed to be facilitative in nature, work in a transparent manner. It is not adversarial and it has no <clears throat> mandate to apply punitive measures, it's supposed to be non-punitive. All that is written <clears throat> into Article 15, Paragraph 2. <clears throat> It also has to avoid duplication of efforts with other mechanisms under the Paris Agreement, and it shall not function as an enforcement or dispute <clears throat> settlement mechanism. It does not impose any sanctions or pa uh, penalties, and it shall respect national sovereignty. Just a second. So these last elements <clears throat> were decided <clears throat> in decision 20 CMA1 adopted also in Katowice and also part of the Paris Agreement rulebook. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, the, just a couple of words about that committee, because in my, my work as, as, as the current co-chair uh, with the committee, I, I realized that there's um, not very much uh, knowledge yet, yet about what the committee does and what it is allowed to do and what it is not allowed to do. So let me just say a couple of words of who the committee currently is and what its functions and, and roles and, and possible measures uh, can be. The committee consists of 20, uh, I'm sorry, of 12 members and you see the, the uh, blue boxes. There are two members each from, from each one of the uh, UN regional groups and one member each from small island developing states and least developing countries. So these are 12 members and each member also has an alternate. So in the end, we are 22, or the committee is supposed to consist of 22 people, 12 members and 12 um, alternates. <clears throat> in Paris, it was also decided in the decision adopting the Paris Agreement, it was also decided that in the composition of the compliance uh, committee, uh, there should be a consideration of gender balance and that uh, parties, uh, uh, people work in their own expert capacity uh, for a maximum of two terms of three years each. 
And the um, individuals working in the um, or on the committee uh, have to have recognized competence in relevant fields, not just lawyers, but also scientific, technical, and socio socioeconomic uh, fields. <clears throat> this is how the committee currently is uh, composed. You see the two members and two alternates for each one of the uh, five uh, UN regional groups and then the LDCs and the SITs. And my uh, co-chair is Mr. Hasib Guha from, from Pakistan and myself, we, we are uh, the, the current co-chairs. But you also see that there are several uh, seats still pending. Uh, Grulak has three seats pending and we have one further uh, vacant seat for Eastern Europe that just recently became um, uh, vacant. Um, but this is how the committee currently looks like. And we have been meeting for the first time last year and have been meeting only virtually since then, unfortunately. But uh, we, we, we are meeting and we're doing our work. Okay, back to what the committee actually does. Um, there are three modes of an issue coming to the compliance committee. The first mode of initiation is that a party can always by itself come to the committee when it itself faces issues with implementation of compliance or compliance of its own obligations or commitments under the Paris Agreement. So a party could always come and uh, of course, it, the expectation and the hope is that parties actually do because the committee can actually help and support and insist in uh, implementation challenges. It's not only uh, dealing with non-compliance, but also um, deterring non-compliance at an earlier stage when a party realizes it may have difficulties with, with for example, um, communicating a next NDC or providing its biennial uh, uh, transparency report due to whatever capacity challenges or whatever it may be. The second way that an issue can come to the committee is by what we call automatic initiation by the committee uh, if there is a violation of the core legal arguments uh, obli obligation, the core legal um, uh, obligations that parties have under the Paris Agreement. And that is listed what these core legal obligations are, is explicitly listed in Decision 20 CMA 1 in paragraph 22A. And I have that on the next slide, I come back to that. And the third way that um, the Compliance Committee can, or Implementation and Compliance Committee can deal with an issue is um, that it has discretionary um, um, a discretionary mandate to initiate uh, proceedings with the consent of the party in cases where the technical expert review teams in their report identify significant and persistent uh, reporting inconsistencies, where a party consistently and significantly uh, reported in a way that is inconsistent with the modalities procedures and guidelines for reporting as adopted in decision 18 CMA 1. <clears throat> so going back to what we called automatic uh, initiation, it's, it's not really automatic, there is no automatism, there are still people in this committee. Uh, but uh, the, the decision from Katowice for the modalities and procedures for the compliance committee says that the committee will, it will initiate the considerations of issues in cases where a party has not. And then you see those four um, cases uh, where a party has not, for example, communicated or maintained an NDC. So where we have the situation that there is no NDC, given that this is one of the core legal obligations, the committee will initiate consideration of this issue, literal A. Or the second one, the committee will initiate consideration of issues where a party has not submitted a mandatory report or communication of information on Article 13. This is just another way of saying the biennial transparency report because that term wasn't around, but it's not the biennial transparency report itself, but it's the mandatory elements in the report, which I showed to you earlier, the greenhouse gas inventory, the progress report for everyone, or the information on uh, support by developed countries. So if that mandatory information or uh, report is missing, if a party has not submitted it, the committee will 
initiate um, considerations of this issue. The third one is that the committee will initiate consideration where a party has not facilitated, um, sorry, not participated in the facilitative multilateral consideration of progress, the FMCP, because it is a legal requirement to participate in that, pro uh, in that uh, uh, process of the, the uh, uh, FMCP. So if a party does not participate, and here we still have to find out what it means not participate because it's actually quite a long process, uh, but it is a possibility for the committee to, to pick this up. And finally, the committee will initiate consideration of issues where a developed country party has not submitted its mandatory biannual communication under Article 9.5. This is information on projected levels of uh, finance, financial support, uh, provided to to be provided to uh, developing country parties, uh, and this information does not go through the transparency framework. It is it has a separate channel and it's put separately out on the UNFCCC website. But if a developed country party does not communicate this information every other year, then it is an issue for the uh, implementation and compliance committee. Um, as I said, the, the committee can pick up on the uh, reports by the technical expert review teams in situations of significant and persistent inconsistencies with the um, reporting modalities, <clears throat> but here only with the consent of the party concerned. That consent requirement is not the case in the four modalities that I just showed you uh, on the previous slide. And in this case, the uh, com committee has uh, discretion. It may uh, pick up this issue, but it may also not decide not to. Very importantly is that the committee in its work will not look at the content of an NDC or a financial report or the BTR. It will not look at the content of the contributions, communications, informational report. It only looks at whether the report was communicated, was submitted or not. We call it like a binary check, yes or no, but not what is in there. That is not something that the committee is uh, can be concerned with. And then the big question is, of course, what can the committee do in cases where parties have not uh, basically complied with uh, their, their um, measures or if they come to the committee and say, please <laughs> help us, we, we would like to uh, seek your, your guidance and support. And here the committee has a whole um, toolbox of, of measures also decided in, in decision 20 CMA1, where it can, of course, always engage first of all, in a dialogue with the party to, to find out what is the, what is the problem, what, what is the challenge here, to share information, identify the challenges, and then hopefully recommend a solution to it. It can also assist the party in engaging with support arrangements under the Paris Agreement. These are different uh, mechanisms like the um, PCCB or the Adaptation Fund or whatever so support mechanisms there are or the green, uh, uh, the GCF, the uh, Green Climate uh, Fund. Um, but uh, it is something that the party can then make recommendations to the party itself and help to communicate those recommendations to the support arrangements. Um, the committee can further recommend to the party to develop a, um, an action plan of how the party itself considers what is needed to come back into compliance or implementation. And finally, the committee is able to issue findings of fact in relation to um, the matters listed, uh, those four uh, legal core obligations, if, if no uh, compliance uh, is, is achieved. But most of all, the most important thing is that the committee shall take appropriate measures, and that has to be seen in relation to each case on its own. Um, <clears throat> to try to graphically highlight this, and here credits really have to go to, to Gao, who, who did this, um, this graphic kind of animation thing, but we, we found it helpful for us to understand how this all fits together, and maybe, hopefully you might find this also um, interesting. Uh, you see from the top to the bottom is what the party is supposed to do and how this may trigger down all the way to the compliance implementation and compliance committee. 
As I already said, if a party, developed country party, uh, has the obligation to communicate um, uh, projected levels of finance every other year, if it does so, that's fine and nothing happens. If it doesn't, this is an issue that the committee will take up. It doesn't go through the transparency framework. The second one is the communication of an NDC. As I already mentioned, if a party does not communicate an NDC, this is an issue which will go straight to the compliance committee. If the party has an NDC, then of course you, you enter the whole uh, uh, channel of the transparency framework where then every other year a biannual transparency report, the BTR, is required, which has to contain the information that I put in that black, black box. And IR is the National Inventory Report. The information on uh, progress is Article 7, uh, 13, Paragraph 7, Litra B, and then for developed country parties, only the information on support. If a party does not submit these or some of this mandatory information, this is an issue which will go to the Compliance Implementation and Compliance Committee. If there is a BTR which contains the mandatory elements of information, then this BTR goes to the technical expert review and ends up with the technical expert review report, T-E-R-R. Of course, if there is no BTR, it cannot go to a technical expert review, uh, uh, through a technical expert review, because this is nothing would be there for the technical expert and that's why it would go straight to the compliance committee under under this um, link so but let's assume there is a btr it goes through the technical expert review it goes through the uh, and, and the technical expert review teams come up with their report and if then that report contains recommendations and remember recommendations only apply to the mandatory reporting requirements and if these recommendations are on elements that are significant and persistent, which means that they have to be pointed out several times, and with the consent of the party, this issue can then be picked up by the compliance committee. And finally, the uh, participation in the facilitative multilateral consideration of progress is also something that is required. And if a party does not participate, Again, that's an issue that the committee will consider. Uh, if the party uh, participates, then that's of course nothing that the co committee will um, uh, look at. Um, there is one small aspect where the um, situation can be that there is no biennial transparency report, but a party will nevertheless participate in the FMCP. That is something being uh, dealt with under paragraph 198 of the transparency decision in the Katowice framework. So all this, this black box is uh, things that go through the transparency framework, but may also get to the compliance committee in cases where we don't have a report or where there are significant or and persistent inconsistency. And the rest that you see there will go to the uh, uh, compliance committee in cases of non-submission, non-communication of these uh, mandatory um, uh, pieces of, 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 of these obligations. Um, in these cases here, as I said, the committee will take up the issue. There is no discretion and it has this whole toolbox of measures. And only in this uh, dotted line here where the consent of the party is required and where the committee has discretion, um, the, the committee has a more limited range of measures that it can apply. But this is pretty much the entire Paris Agreement put into one slide. There are, of course, some elements missing, but there is a lot of logic of how this flows through the, uh, through the different elements of the agreement and how legally binding obligations are being picked up uh, and, and sort of guided through uh, the, the different mechanisms, transparency and implementation and compliance committee under the uh, agreement. So what does it tell us about accountability? Of course, we think it is um, when it comes to the, let's say the tail end of our, our um, traffic light system, it is maybe not strong, let's say it's stronger, <laughs> maybe strong is, is not the right term here, but it's stronger because we do have guidance on implementation and compliance. 
uh, but it does not establish new guidance on parties. The guidance we have is really only for the committee. Uh, the, the guidance on parties is the guidance that we have under the respective obligations, either in the pairs agreement or in the pairs agreements rulebook. But there is, of course, a review because the committee is um, required to consider issues of performance, whether it is um, a legally binding obligation and it has been fulfilled or not, yes, no, uh, or of significant and persistent inconsistency with the reporting requirements or of systemic issues. That is a matter that I haven't mentioned yet. The committee can also take up um, systemic uh, issues. These are issues that are faced by a certain number of parties. It's not an individual performance, but the idea is that the committee in its work will of course gain a lot of insight of how parties do and how they um, struggle or not struggle. And there may be the mm, situation that several parties come forward this, with the same challenge. They all say, oh, we, we cannot, for example, um, communicate our adaptation communication because there is a too tight deadline or something that points to a systemic challenge under the pairs agreement. Um, and that's something that the committee can then um, address and put uh, to or bring to the attention of the CMA. And of course, there are uh, measures that the committee can apply. I already mentioned there's a whole toolbox, a whole list of measures, including recommendation of a um, compliance action plan or issuing findings of fact. Now, just a final work, uh, word on the committee. We are currently developing the rules of procedure not everything was supposed to be or, or could be agreed in Katowice on modalities and procedures. And there is a concrete mandate to develop the rules of procedure to be adopted by CMA3 in Glasgow. Um, and so the committee is meeting virtually and working out these um, draft rules of procedure to be recommended then to the CMA and hopefully adopted in, in Glasgow. And this is just um, to wrap it up our assessment of these di different degrees of accountability under the pairs agreement. Again, we applied that traffic light system, fairly uh, weak uh, accountability when it comes to NDC uh, guidance and review, um, no review, no measures. Stronger when it comes to transparency and of course then strongest um, uh, with regard to compliance measures. So we, we identified fairly strong accountability for those very few individually legally binding core obligations that parties have. These are only procedural obligations, but for those there is um, a fairly strong accountability both through the transparency framework and eventually through the uh, uh, implementation and compliance committee. Primarily they do not go through the transparency framework, but uh, that is why the, the committee can then pick them up. And these are the obligations which are the, the backbone, the spine of the agreement. Medium accountability applies to the uh, uh, reporting and accounting obligations that go through the transparency uh, framework. And only if they're inconsistencies and if they're persistent, they can go to the uh, compliance uh, um, uh, committee. And uh, this is what, why we call it the accountability continuum because it comes from the transparency and then to the compliance uh, committee. And weak accountability applies to those legal uh, precision obligations with regard to the information that parties need to put into their NDC uh, because there is no review mechanism under the agreement. But of course, the transparency about uh, NDCs, they're all put um, online, allow for peer pressure and allow for bottom up pressure, for example, by civil society or by voters in the next round of voting, voting uh, votes or elections or in hearings in national uh, legal systems. And let me just round up with the expectations for COP26. Of course, this lecture series is on the road to COP26 and CMA3. Of course, here, these are all elements that are, are, are under consideration of CMA, not, not the COP. But there are expectations, of course, uh, fairly high expectations that um, the outstanding rules on the effective um, operation of the Paris Agreement are completed. And there are a couple of rules that are still missing. Um, there are um, no common timeframes, as you may know. Uh, the the uh, Paris Agreement and Article 411 
um, uh, requires common timeframes for NDCs, but that has not been decided. And as you may know, some NDCs have five year timeframes, others have 10 years, and it's a bit of a mess <laughs> currently. So there are um, uh, negotiations going on on um, agreeing, hopefully, on common timeframes in, in Glasgow. And then there are some outstanding aspects with regard to the uh, transparency framework, especially the common reporting tables for the BTRs and also the outline for the technical expert review reports. These are, that sounds quite technical and minimal, but these are quite difficult negotiations uh, on, on these technical, <coughs> sorry, technical aspects of the transparency framework and hopefully uh, those will be agreed on in, in Glasgow and Article 6, of course, but that's something we all know. Um, I won't go into this. And as I also mentioned, the rules for um, the rules of procedure for the compliance committee, um, implementation and compliance committee are also hopefully adopted by CMA3. And the last two aspects, uh, these are not negotiation aspects, but also very important elements that um, probably have to be seen in the context of COP26 CMA3, is that the biannual communications of projected levels of fin uh, finance, ex ante finance, are expected or were expected to be um, starting last year. Uh, in 2020, and several developed countries, country parties have put forward uh, their ex ante finance communications last year, and some have done it uh, this year. Not all yet, there are still some or one missing, um, but it is probably something that will uh, create quite a lot of focus and attention and discussion in Glasgow because communication of projected levels of finance is of course something that reflects back on the, for many developing countries parties on, on the uh, level of ambition that they're willing to put into the NDCs in terms of uh, conditioned and unconditioned parts of, of their uh, target. So I, we haven't really heard much about this yet, but I, I have a feeling that this will become quite a big um, discussion point in, in Glasgow. And finally, as, as you all know, there's the expectation or the request to update and or enhance um, NDCs, depending on what kind of timeframes parties had in their initial NDC. Um, and we've seen quite a bit of updating um, and some enhancing uh, yet, but uh, hopefully on in the next couple of months towards um, COP26 CMA3, we see more parties coming forward with their updated or enhanced NDCs. And I think, yeah, I think that was the end of my, <laughs> my slides and I'm looking forward to the discussion and, and hopefully uh, lots of questions. Thank you very much, Christina. That was so insightful and uh, absolutely fascinating talk and uh, really interesting to stress, you know, the role of the law is really important and it often is decided in the detail of these uh, negotiations uh, on the aspects of the Paris rule book and those that are still outstanding. Uh, we've got 11 questions in the Q&A section. Um, am I allowed one very quick question, perhaps? I'm not going to take much time. I just wanted to have one um, or share one observation and it would be interesting to have your view on that. So when I read this, um, the synthesis report that came out in on the 26th of February on the so far updated and enhanced NDCs, I was quite uh, surprised and encouraged to see that many parties have actually provided the ICTU, even though this will not go under expert review, as you so clearly demonstrated. So do you think that is a really good sign that is something that is created by this peer pressure um, or is it a, a too optimistic view maybe? Um. No, no, I don't think so. I think it's actually, it's a really helpful tool for parties to have that structure, that skeleton to, to guide them in, in how to, you know, how to design, how to structure an NDC. It's, it's not a, like you have to do that and, that and that. Of course you, 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 sh you should do, but it's more like something that is supposed to make it easier for parties to, to, to put forward and put together their NDC. As you may know, the first NDCs, or initially called INDCs, were su submitted prior to the adoption of the Paris Agreement, and they were structured along the lines of a paragraph in the decision from Lima, which contained 
broad categories of things that should go in an NDC. And most parties follow that, <clears throat> follow these, these categories. And what we have now in the ICTU from Katowice is based on these broad categories, but it's much more uh, defined in detail. So it was nothing new to parties that ended up in the decision from Katowice. So maybe the only thing that was new uh, were the requirements to, uh, you know, provide information on how, how your, IN, uh, your NDC is reflecting your highest possible ambition and, and then progress or progression in, in next time around. But I think parties do follow ICTU uh, guidance because it simply is, is helpful. And I think they also understand that if, if uh, NDCs are supposed to feed in the global stock tag, they have to be somehow comparable. You can't have apples and oranges and aubergines or whatever. You have to have some, some sort of currency that you can compare. And I think it, it just simply makes sense to, to follow the, the ICTU guidance. Yeah, thank you very much. So I will now start um, with questions here. So we've got here one from Melissa Lowe. Do you see the COP26 postponement and delay of finalization of the common reporting formats and common tabular formats for parties to report greenhouse gas inventories and track progress towards implementing and achieving their NDCs as a problem? And does it put a risk to structural integrity of the ETF's operationalization? And what implications might this have on the work of the um, PIA ICC if work conclusion is delayed further? Well, <laughs> we simply have to deal with the situation as it is and, and try to make the best of it. Now, as I said, the, the first biannual transparency reports are due in 2024. So we still have some time to come uh, until parties actually have to provide that information on the national inventory report, uh, progress report and so forth. So having a year delay, hopefully, in, in, in agreeing on these outstanding issues isn't such a big problem as long as it is agreed now in, in Glasgow. This is hopefully not what's going to happen. Um, if it's further delayed, it may cause problems for the for the first um, for the first uh, um, biennial transparency reports in in um, in 2024. Um, we have a bit of a, a challenge here because the first stock tag is actually prior to the first BTRs being submitted, and it would have been helpful to have some reports prior to the stock tag. But this is, you know, just the, the cranking into motion of the Paris Agreement isn't easy, but we have not seen most of the uh, procedures starting yet, and we just, you know, are at the, at the, at the, the step to, to, to kick this into motion. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, the, the, the issue of um, negotiations. It's been very difficult uh, to have virtual meetings uh, due to all sorts of, of challenges. Uh, I can only talk from the, the compliance committee's uh, view, which have met, has met virtually, and we have some kind of internal <laughs> negotiations just between the you know, 24 people, not 197 states or something. But there are issues with uh, uh, technology, um, internet uh, accessibility, timelines, or the time, you know, we have all sorts of different uh, timelines to respect, but also to just to create mutual trust and, and confidence is very, very difficult. As, as, as Nilofro know, it's difficult enough if you're in the same room, but at least you see each other and you can talk and you can meet in the, in the hallways or you know, over coffee, but in that virtual format, it's just not there. And that of course uh, impacts on, on how much willingness you put forward in, in finding compromise and, and, and consensus. And we, we, we can only hope really that, that Glasgow is going forward in a, I don't know, virtual uh, hybrid, but also in-person um, meeting manner that, that parties can, can re-establish or, or you know, continue in that very constructive way as, as we were at least in, in Katowice. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christina. Now we've got the next question here is from Harold van Asselt. Thanks for an excellent, excellent presentation on the rules of procedure of the committee. To what extent do you expect the proceedings will be open to accredited observers, whether virtual or in person? Will input from observers be possible and will all documentation be made publicly available? 
I think it's the rules of procedure for yeah, the I understand the question very well. Um, hello, Haro. Um, difficult, difficult question. No, not difficult question. It's, of course, one of the aspects that we are currently um, uh, looking at and, and discussing in the development of the rules of procedure. Uh, we, we haven't really decided yet on that. We've been looking at uh, currently at you know, electronic decision making and, and that sort of thing. Uh, we expect that what the committee is going to get in its rules of procedure will not undercut what other and how other committees and uh, constituted bodies under the FN, UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement work. Um, as I said, by the end of the day, it's a decision by the CMA to be a taken in Glasgow that will adopt the rules of procedure and I honestly do not uh, think that the CMA will agree on something that is weaker in terms of um, transparency and, and accessibility for, for, non, for, for observers, non-party stakeholders uh, than, than what we have otherwise in the, uh, in the UN FCCC realm, but we'll have to, have to see. Whether all documentation will be made public, that is something I, I doubt. I think there are always some documents, some pieces of information that will need to remain confidential. Uh, we, this is pretty much the only body that will deal with individual challenges uh, by parties and there are already requirements from the decision in Katowice which say that some aspects that deal with uh, parties um, uh, information is, is, is supposed to be dealt with uh, with, with confidentiality. Uh, so I, I don't think that everything will be made possible, but of course the reports are, are publicly available and they're already there on the website and they will remain uh, to be so. Thank you very much, Christina. Very clear. So now here's one that's really nice. Greetings, Christina, Nilofa, and Petra, and congratu congratulations, if I may, on an all-women panel. <laughs> so the question is then from Sunil uh, Mulita Shastri, who said that, uh, many of my concerned but non-nuanced friends ask me about accountability, transparency, and compliance too. All they see is this inexorable and inevitable rise of CO2 ppm to 420 before long. As a non-expert, what should be my answer to the woman or man on the street? My question arises from the fact that many of these reports are notoriously difficult to comprehend even by the reasonably educated person. Hmm. Yeah, well, hi, Sunil. <laughs> it's, of course, uh, a very relevant and very legitimate question. But I would like to go back to the definition of accountability that Gao and, and I adopted in that, in that um, paper where we say accountability, we look at accountability in terms of accountability of parties in relation to their obligations under the Paris Agreement and the mechanism established under the Paris Agreement. So we can only look at these procedural obligations that parties have and their accountability in the context of those obligations. That does not amount to a general accountability to meet the, let's say, the stay well below two degree, 1.5 degree temperature goal. This is not part of that accountability framework as it is designed under the Paris Agreement because of the collectiveness of the goal and because of the fact that the, the content uh, of the NDCs is not legally binding, but it is in a way picked up by the transparency framework, at least by making that um, that that information available and enabling the global stock take or the Secretariat and its synthesis report to, to say, wh where are we? And then use this information by civil society, by everyone, by voters in their domestic uh, systems to push for more ambition, to push governments and politicians to become more ambitious, because this is what the Paris Agreement by the end of the day is really all about. It is a tool for civil society, for decision makers, for, the, for stakeholders to push governments towards higher level of ambition at the level that actually matters in terms of reaching the, the goals of the, of the Paris Agreement. And it's not just a temperature goal, there's also an adaptation goal and a finance goal in Article 2. Yeah, thank you very much, Christina. I totally agree. I mean, at the end of the day, we can we, we need national action and national ambition. So the international legal framework can't be overloaded with these expectations. We still need to have the ambition at the national level and, and also the ambition that is compared with the highest possible standard 
in any one country and not compared to other states, as sometimes happens. There has been this case uh, in the Berlin Administrative Court where the judge found that the German target was already quite ambitious compared to other international targets, but that's not the right comparative unit, so to speak. It's really the comparison with one's own ambitious goals that one could have. So. If I can just uh, have a quick reply on that, uh, Petra. Uh, of course, there is another aspect to it because uh, we see this general rise in litigation. I didn't mean to talk about litigation, but what we see is that domestic courts and perhaps even regional courts are looking at the standard of care that is required by parties under the pairs agreement. And it's there, then they don't just look at whether there, there is an NDC or not, but whether the NDC is at the level of highest possible ambition or even progression as identified in article 4.3 as a due diligence requirement that informs the, the standard of care, for example, under human rights law or constitutional provisions. Uh, so suddenly these, oblig uh, these uh, provisions under the pairs agreement, which may not be legally binding or reviewable under the agreement, gain legal relevance in the context of litigation under other norms, uh, for example, human rights norms or, or constitutional norms. Yes, absolutely. So I think the next question really fits well within this discussion now. It's from Gilam Finania Garalia. What is the legal nature of the requirement under Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the Paris Agreement, read in the light of Article 3, that each party's nationally determined contribution should reflect its highest possible ambition? Is it a binding obligation under the current international law, and if so, to what extent? Fantastic question. <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to, but I actually have written quite a bit on this. Um, in my view, it is a um, standard of conduct. It's not a, an obligation of result, but it's an obligation of conduct that parties are under the expect legal expectation that their NDC will reflect their highest possible ambition, at least on the Article 4, Paragraph 3, um, that they will do as, as good as they can, basically, in designing their NDC and in, in implementing and in achieving it. But as I said, there is no, uh, no mechanism under the agreement and the Paris Agreement to pick up on that, but it can be done so under, under in domestic courts or domestic systems. And also we have many countries that have put their uh, NDC target into domestic climate acts, legally binding uh, acts, legislation, regulation. And that of course can be reviewed by domestic courts. But in, in the context of the article four paragraph three requirement of highest possible ambition, I, I would say it's a due diligence requirement to, to adopt all um, or the best efforts, all appropriate and, and necessary measures at the level of each country's own capacity, but also in light of the risk at stake and in light of the uh, overall uh, temperature goal um, of, the, of the Paris Agreement and in light of best available science. Thank you very much. So we've got 19 questions. We've got already oh, 20 now. So it's going up. So I'm going to read really fast now. So from Prana Afghanistan, is there a possibility that the committee may be able to conclusively assess a party as developed or developing where a party has improperly self-defined itself, given that there is no provision in the agreement that defines developed and developing? Oh, difficult question. Uh, <laughs> we hope that the committee is never going to be put in, into that situation, um, that we have to resolve this issue at the, at the tail end of the agreement. Um, we, uh, we haven't discussed this yet in, in the, um, in the uh, agreement, but I think uh, in the committee, but the understanding of the peers agreement is basically, you know, a self categorization of parties of where they see themselves and some may move on from where they were to, to another level of development. But this is basically left to parties as we do not have any annexes or categories defined any, any longer under the, under the Paris Agreement as we had under the UNFCCC. Thank you very much. So Pei Chu and Chang, thank you for your insightful talk. I have a question regarding the non-compliance mechanism under the Paris Agreement. It seems that the mechanism does not provide an inter-party submission. Uh, if a party finds that another party is not complying with the agreement, 
it can make a complaining submission to the committee. As far as I know, it is contained in the non-compliance mechanism in many other multilateral environmental agreements, though seldom used in practice. But why does it appear in the Paris Agreement? Thank you again. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's absolutely right. There is no party to party trigger under the Paris Agreement. It was not politically acceptable. It, it was, and maybe Nilofer can, can confirm that it was a bit of a miracle by the end of the negotiations in Paris that we actually do have a compliance uh, aspect. It was close to falling out entirely, but there are a couple of compromises that needed to, to be cut. And one of them was that it was not politically feasible to have a party to party trigger. Thank you. Nilufa, did you want to come in on that as well? Or? Uh, um, no, just yes, Christina's right. Um, uh, it was meant to be, you know, facilitative purely and, and really uh, not uh, punitive in any way. Um, so that party to party was out. So, um, but I have to say that Christina's presentation, uh, was, I was really impressed because despite the soft nature intended, you really see, as you see that continuum, that it will have, an, it should have some impact despite, but in a positive way. So be, I'm really looking forward to see how it actually does become implemented. Thank you, Nilo, for as well. Now, the next question is from Minmaye Takua. Looking at some of ease provided in the Paris Agreement to the participant countries, what changes are you expecting at COP26 to improve implementation and progress towards achieving the target climate goals? Uh, I didn't understand the beginning of the question. Look at some of the ease. Um, yeah, like, like the yeah the ease, or the probably it means um, the I cannot read the question, it's too small. It just says ease. I, I would interpret it as the lack of um, obligations, of substantial obligations in the Paris Agreement to the participant countries. So the many loopholes that are still available to them, I would interpret it. Okay, oh, now I see. Now actually, I see. Oh, ease. <laughs> I just didn't. Yeah. Like, what, what are the eases? Yeah. Um, uh, well, <laughs> this is kind of what I tried to to explain it's really you have to see the entire agreement in its um well in its entirety basically there, there are a lot of compromises a lot of different aspects to it but it all has a, a certain ratio to it there, there's a there's a logic that that follows or flows through it and of course one of the eases is that ndc content is not legally binding this is a very big ease um, but it was necessary for political reasons that, that we perhaps all know. Uh, but because the content of the, the NDCs is not legally binding, we have a fairly strong transparency framework, which is meant to counterbalance that aspect by making that information absolutely available to anyone. You can go to the website, hopefully in 2024, and look at the progress reports of how countries are implementing and achieving their NDC, and then be critical, you know, then take this up. It can be taken up by all sorts of discussions, media, uh, scholarly reports, or court cases, or God knows what. There is a lot of possibility that can flow out of that publicly accessible, accessible in information. And of course, that is that is one of the, the counterbalancing um, effects. But you know, it's it's all a big interesting construction, and it, it's probably difficult to see how that all flows together. But I, I, I tried as best as I could in my slides to, to explain it. No, absolutely. I think you did that. And it's it's impossible to achieve these goals if there's not the ambition at the national level. I think that's what comes quite clearly from the synthesis report. Again, we are missing the 2030 target unless there will be more ambition. Um, so there is another question now from Jessica Los Banos. Uh, thank you, Christina. Are there mechanisms to assist and build capacity for developing countries to measure their actual greenhouse gas emissions so they can accurately identify and or set their NDCs and effectively comply with their Paris Agreement obligations over time? Are current technologies, facilities, systems by developed countries 
that actually track the greenhouse gas emissions for each geographic area, uh, remote sensing made freely available such that each developing country can be provided a starting point of their greenhouse gas levels so that each country uh, can build their capacity to build such an inventory. So it's about this yeah, technology and data collection possibilities. Okay, so the, this is this is quite a complex uh, issue. <laughs> it's, a, it's a complex question, but of course, under the Paris Agreement and already under the Convention, there are various mechanisms and and frameworks to enhance capacity, to enhance. There's a technology framework. There's the Paris Agreement Committee on Capacity Building. There there are different aspects that are in in different ways targeted towards enhancing general capacity or technology technological capacity of developing countries, uh, either in a general manner or in an individual specific manner, uh, they all work differently. And of course, there's uh, the GCF and, and, and the GEF to a certain extent, the, as, as uh, uh, David explained uh, last, uh, last time, the, the financial mechanisms that are also aimed at enhancing the capacity uh, of developing countries. But and that's maybe a piece of information which seems to be flying a little bit under the radar. The Implementation and Compliance Committee is also a, um, a, a venue to pursue and a body to go to for developing countries that face capacity challenges because the committee can uh, develop action plans, it can reach out to the support mechanisms, uh, it can provide recommendations both to the party and to the support mechanism or forward them to the support mechanisms. It's not because it has that word compliance, it sounds a little bit scary, but it also is an implementation, a facilitative implementation body, which is designed to, to support and, and help uh, uh, countries, parties that, that struggle with their, with their commitments, with their implementation, that can be capacity, that can be technological uh, issues. And, and well, we see how the, we have to see how the committee deals with that, but in the way it is designed, it is meant to address these, uh, these challenges as well. Thank you very much. Christina, I shouldn't hide from you. There are lots of compliments in the chat. So I've got just one nice remark here from Sandrine, uh, my John Dubois. Dear Christina, thanks a lot for your insightful presentation. And I'm trying now to combine two questions. Uh, so I hopefully will be forgiven if this doesn't work out as uh, it was perhaps intended, but I think they do fit uh, uh, together. So Nat Natalia Kobiliats and Ronaldo Gutierrez. So uh, the question is here, is uh, the Paris Agreement providing a mechanism that is capable of leading to more ambitious NDCs to close the emission gap that we still see, the 45% of greenhouse gas emission reductions that are necessary according to the IPCC uh, by 2030, which we don't see if we base it on this latest report. And um, then in relation to that, is the Compliance Committee eventually um, able to come up with an overall assessment of the sufficiency of the substance of the NDCs? Um, well, when it comes to the, the overall cranking up of, of ambition. Of course, there are more elements under the Paris Agreement than what I addressed here now under the accountability framework. Um, it, it, it might take another lecture to <laughs> explain that all, but I can, I can you know, try very basically. Of course, we have the, the ambition, I don't want to really, really call it cycle, but the ambition upward, maybe spiral, where you, you communicate an NDC and then report on its implementation and progress. But also there is a global stock take every five years. It sort of sits in between the, the points of time for the NDC communication. And the global stock take is meant to, or it aims at taking stock of the collective progress towards the goals of the agreement. But very importantly, the, uh, and the global stock take will always have as an outcome, oh, we should be here, but we're only here and there is a gap in between. And the outcome of the global stock take is of course meant to inform the next round of NDCs to pull up ambition. And that comes in addition to those guiding concepts of progression. You know, parties are nevertheless required to have a more progressive NDC next time around, but is also informed by the global stock take. And it is supposed to be at the highest level of ambition, the highest possible ambition. So these are normative elements, normative guidance that the agreement sets up 
for cranking up or raising ambition. And then of course you have the, the transparency framework, which also will enable um, you know, peer review, peer pressure, bottom-up pressure. And then it all starts again uh, to, to from, from, from the beginning. So you have to see all these different elements in a in a spiral, not, not, not the cycle. Cycles sounds like you end up where you started, but you know, it's an upward spiral, hopefully. Whether the compliance committee has a has a role and function in, in raising ambition. Well, that's something that needs to be seen. But what I said early on, it is very important that parties actually do what they said they would do in terms of their legally binding obligations. Compliance committee, the compliance or implementation compliance committee is meant to uh, enhance trust and, and confidence. Parties, um, you know, in 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 between them, but also to enable uh, or, or to overcome implementation challenges. And these are all aspects, little bits of pieces in the entire puzzle that hopefully make the, the agreement effective. Thank you very much. Um, there's another question from Russell Quick. Dear Christina, could you elaborate on what you think will happen at COP26 regarding to how the issue of Article 6 of the Article 6 mechanism will be resolved and what is your interpretation as to how corresponding adjustment should be applied? <laughs> <laughs> really? That's yet another <laughs> full lecture. I think we have a lecture in our lecture series on Article 6 in particular. Um, well, the only thing I can, can say is that, yes, it would be really good to finalize the negotiations in Article 6, not just the mechanism in Article 6.4, but also in Article 6.2 and Article 6.8 in non-market uh, um, um, aspects. Um, but what we've seen, of course, in the meantime, is that parties go forward and have bilateral agreements like Switzerland did with Peru and, and Ghana, where they just implement Article 6.2 and say, oh, you know, just don't wait until this to, to be finalized. We, we can do it uh, in, in our bilateral work. Um, that doesn't apply to Article 6.4. The, 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 um, uh, the, the, the 6 4 mechanism where we actually do need international rules to make this uh, operational. But we will, we will see you know, how far we get. I don't have a crystal ball. I, I follow the informal discussions and uh, you know, there were quite a lot of, uh, was quite a lot of progression towards uh, agreement in, in, uh, in Madrid in 2019. And in the end, uh, the, the parties couldn't, couldn't decide, couldn't find a compromise. But I, I had the feeling they weren't that far away from each other anymore. And I think maybe two years <laughs> in between gave them some time to resolve the remaining issues. And hopefully we see um, the, the finalization of Article 6 rules. Yeah, thank you. Great. So we've got now 28 uh, questions, but I think some of them are really the nice, you know, uh, uh, commentary on that this was such an excellent and very clear uh, presentation and discussion. Uh, but there is a question now from Alessandra Agogli. Uh, based on what you have said about the need for the NDC to be comparable, do you think that having mandatory guidelines for the parties when formulating their NDC, basically by strengthening the ICTU mechanism would help in this regard? And if so, do you think this is something feasible in the context of climate negotiations? Oh, in a perfect world, that would have been super good <laughs> to have. Of course, if we had really binding guidance on, on, uh, on how the NDC should look like and a review mechanism, that would have been fantastic and probably you know, increase the effectiveness of the agreement quite significantly, but we don't have it. And there are reasons for why that wasn't possible. And we just have to, you know, live with what we have. It doesn't mean that in the future, the CMA may find out, maybe we should look at this issue again and maybe adopt, you know, more, more, more binding issues and establish a review mechanisms for this, for the NDCs. We don't know. It could be something we see, you know, in the development of the Paris Agreement uh, in, in the years to come. But currently we don't have it, uh, even though it would have been good to have. But it doesn't mean that this, this means that the entire agreement doesn't work. Um, for, for the reason that I tried to outline, uh, many parties uh, comply with the, with the ICTU guidelines for, for various reasons. And, you know, most of the parties comply with their international <laughs> obligations most of the time, as we all know. Uh, and, and this seems also to be the case in, in, the, in the Paris Agreement. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Maybe I can add one observation because if you take these uh, rules and even the ICTU guidance as an expression of the subsequent agreement of parties on the substance of the Paris Agreement in accordance with Article 31 of the Vienna, uh, Paragraph 3a of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, you can say that this is actually something that they have taken forward in terms of interpreting uh, these provisions. And if states agree on a certain interpretation, then this may amount to something that is actually then becoming legally binding, whether they like it or not. So it's different, when, you know, whether we look at this from the doctrine of law making or uh, creation of obligations or interpreting existing obligations, perhaps. So I think that can also um, um, help maybe this view to, to view it, it that you know, under the doctrine of interpretation. Um, so I've got, I think, one more question here. Do you think we can go one more, Christina? There are lots of thank oh, you. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy. Okay. Do you expect the rules? Uh, so that's Kimberly Graham. Do you expect the rules for the common reporting tables for the biennial transparency report, which are still to be completed, to include considerations for the ocean? Oh, I, I I have to give a pass here <laughs> before I say something wrong. I better say I, I'm I'm not entirely sure. I I don't think so that there will be anything specific on on marine um, uh, aspects, but th there may be. I haven't really looked at the uh, at the issue more specifically. We do have some more specific uh, reporting rules for uh, land use and forests. Um, primarily because it has a long history in the in the you know FN UN uh, um, UN uh, climate regime, while oceans have not, and and Nidalfer knows everything about it. It made its way into the <laughs> preamble, um, and and also in Article Five, Paragraph One, which everybody looks at forest, but it talks about um, you know the ecosystem ecosystems in general, I, I have to look at it, but it includes also uh, terrestrial uh, systems for removal at least. Um, and there is no, uh, if parties include uh, um, marine uptake, for example, or measures in, in, in the oceans in the NDC, then of course they will also to have to report on it through their biennial transparency report. And this is part of this Continuum, you know, once you get something in the NDC, it flows through the the reporting requirements of the Paris Agreement. So and there are a couple of parties, quite quite a lot actually, that included uh, ocean related aspects in terms of mitigation and adaptation uh, in their NDCs. And of course, if they report on their progress in implementing and achieving the NDC, they will also have to report on these ocean related um, aspects. How this is reflected in the in the tabular format, uh, I just I, just, I, I don't know, <laughs> maybe. There may just be a placeholder for that kind of uh, reporting. Yeah, thank you very much. So I'm just trying to pick those questions of uh, some uh, participants who haven't had their question answered because some are uh, repeatedly uh, um, asking questions. So that's why I'm trying to uh, make uh, some form of selection here. I, I hope I can be forgiven if I can't read out all of them now. Uh, so I think we can have one more and that is uh, perhaps giving Christina really the chance to strongly rebut this again and, and give uh, people some munition. So the question is from Amelia Rawlinson, how would you rebut the argument that the voluntary nature of the Paris Agreement's NDCs renders the agreement largely irrelevant, especially given that the recent synthesis report shows that we are not nowhere near the reductions necessary to meet the temperature goal? <laughs> okay, well, yes, that, that's, a, you know, this is the argument you meet time and time again, and, and it's a legitimate one, but I think it, it sort of, it goes against the very nature of the agreement to start from that end, because the Paris Agreement is designed in a way through its iterative processes to pick up everyone from where they were 
in 2015 or 16 when they became a party to the Paris Agreement to where we all collectively have to be in order to meet the overall uh, uh, goals of the agreement. And that cannot happen overnight and it cannot happen in the first NDC or in the enhanced or updated NDC. Um, I, I actually would have to say a little bit about this updating, but we can do it some, somewhere else. But you have to look at the progression over time. And, uh, and the fact that it is not enough yet is, is like, yes, of course, that's why we have the Paris Agreement to get to where we need to be. Of course, we are not there yet. And the NDCs are not uh, at that level of ambition. But this is why we have the stock take. This is why we have these principles of highest possible ambition and progression every time you put forward an NDC to get there where we need to, uh, where we need to be um, at least in in 2030 and then in 2050 of course because we have that global goal of carbon neutrality uh, written squarely into the Paris Agreement in Article 4.1 it's nothing the IPCC just came up with in its 1.5 degree report but it's already in the in the Paris Agreement uh, defined as you know balancing of emissions and removals uh, in the second half of the century. But this is what the entire agreement is meant to achieve. And this is why we have these processes that are just about to kick into motion. So you cannot really criticize it yet for something that hasn't yet started entirely. But I think it's important to keep a critical eye on it and to keep pushing. Uh, but I think it's most important at domestic processes when the next round of NDCs, when they are set again, when the targets are set, when it becomes clear that there may be not enough, use those principles of you know highest possible ambition, of progression, of, uh, of the overall temperature goals and push and push in domestic settings or maybe in, in regional settings uh, at the EU or you know human rights courts or wherever you want to go, use them for all they are worth because it is an instrument, it is an, uh, a tool that can and needs to be used uh, and it lives from how we use it and, and how we recognize it as something important and legally applicable. Thank you so much, Christina. What a wonderful and clear statement at the end. I so really thank you so much, Amelia, as well for this uh, for this question and everyone in the audience for the fabulous and and really um, important questions that were asked and that gave rise to this absolutely uh, important and very insightful discussion and and excellent answers, Christina. Um, so I think we've already uh, gone past the allocated time and. Uh, uh, so I would just, uh, before I hand over to, to Nilofa and Christina as well again, um, say that I really enjoyed this. I hope everyone did. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have you all here. And I hope you will stick with us uh, during the next month so that we have still uh, some lectures to go uh, until we reach the October uh, and, and then November, the conference, hopefully. Uh, so thank you again very much for participating and asking the questions and for a great presentation, Christina, as well. So I hand over to you and Nirofa. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Petra. And, and Christina, that was absolutely a uh, fantastic uh, presentation, lecture. I learned a lot. Um, and I'm sure everyone did listening to you. Um, you really showed um, how the compliance, implementation, transparency, all of that together, the, the trajectory and, um, and I think I'm really waiting in suspense now <laughs> to see the actual operationalization of it. So thank you for your efforts, Christina. You were really such an important part in, in making the compliance happen as well as the entry into force, but that's another day we'll talk about. Um, and can I say 36 questions, this is a record. Uh, thank you all, I'm so sorry we can't you know, um, go to each and every one of these questions. Uh, but thank you so much and stick with us. You can see the lectures, I hope, are really, uh, you know, really preparing for uh, the COP26. So, Christina, over to you. Oh, yeah, well, thank you so much. I, I, I'm kind of losing my voice now at the end of this talk, but it's been an incredible pleasure for me. I, I apparently I like to talk about the Paris Agreement, and giving the, the me the possibility to to engage with the audience on these excellent questions is just such a privilege. I, I 
tremendously enjoyed it. And I just wanted to ask Gary if, if you can save the questions in the chat and maybe I can come back to some of the questions by email to, to those who were, I wasn't able to, to answer. But thank you so much, Nilofer. Thank you so much, Petra. And big thanks to the audience for your patience and your interest and your very, very intriguing and important questions. And thank you also to Gary and Matthew for your uh, technical backup and, and help and, and your support for, for this lecture series. Thanks everyone, stay safe and see you soon.